need the microphone here. Our next speaker is Christian Mosso, who is a professor of comparative literature here at um, Bonn and also the chair of that department. He has published a lot. I have a very long list here. Um, I will mention a few titles. Friedrich Schiller und die Niederlande, um, Texturen um, der barbarischen Exemplarisch. Um, oh, that was it. Sorry, my so hard to read this little thing. Um, and um, Figuren des Globalen. The title of his talk here today is Post-Romantic Agonalism, Kleist ante idealistic poetics of play and its deconstructive legacy. Thank you very much for your kind words of introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak. It's a pleasure to talk to such a prestigious audience. Is it possible to characterize the Prussian writer Heinrich von Kleist as a romantic poet within a German context and even more so within the context of Germanistic, the academic discipline devoted to the study of German literature and its history, the answer to this question has usually been a hesitant no. Though Kleist was acquainted with some major figures of the Romantic movement, Ludwig Tieck, Clemens Brentano, Achim von Arnim, Friedrich de la Motte Fouquet, Adam Müller, to name but a few, Though he shared many of their aesthetic, philosophical, and political interests, literary critics in Germany conventionally characterize him as an outsider, a lone wolf who cannot be classed with any school of writers. In this respect, he resembles Hölderlin, the second notorious eccentric in German literature around 1800. One is tempted to ask, however, whether the, de the desire to identify figures of tragic eccentricity is not itself the outcrop of a romantic myth. If you describe Kleist as a solitary and misunderstood genius, are you not on the way of romanticizing him? Paradoxically, romantic habits of thought seem to be so deeply ingrained in German literary scholarship that they prevent it from recognizing Kleist as a romantic. In any case, if you put aside the German lens, these inhibitions tend to disappear. In the English-speaking world, for instance, it is common to group Kleist with the Romantics. This is not only so because Romanticism in Anglo-American criticism is much more open and, a much more open and germane concept than in Germany, easily accommodating an author such as Goethe, who, from a German perspective, marks the antipode to anything Romantic. It seems to me, however, that there are other reasons for including Kleist in the Romantic canon which are more to the point. Perhaps the strain of radicalism running through British Romanticism, through authors such as Blake, Shelley, but also the young Wordsworth and Coleridge, has sensitized English-speaking writers and critics in particular to respond to the radical elements in Kleist and to classify them as romantic. For example, it is certainly no accident that deconstruction um, that Kleist is a favorite among the more radical thinkers of the American branch of deconstruction. In their attempt to reverse the damnatory verdict passed upon Romanticism by the new critics and to do justice to the complexities of Romantic writing, they frequently refer to certain key figures which are considered to be representative Romantics. Kleist is among the foremost of them. In today's talk, I want to take my cue from such outside views of Kleist in order to reevaluate his position within the force field of German Romanticism. I will proceed from the observation that in deconstructive readings of his texts, as well as in literary adaptations of his works, Kleist is often presented as an antagonist of Friedrich Schiller. While German scholarship traditionally focuses on his so-called Kant-Krise, Kant-Crisis, the shocking overthrow of his teleological worldview allegedly caused by his reading of Immanuel Kant's writings, critics from abroad tend to alert to the fact that Kleist develops his radical critique of Enlightenment thought and his anti-idealist aesthetics not in direct confrontation with Kantian philosophy, but by engaging with Schiller's theoretical and literary appropriations of Kantian concepts. Indeed, references to Schiller abound in Kleist's works. Schiller's historiography and philosophy of history are evoked in his comedy The Broken Jug 
as well as in the collection of short prose pieces entitled Unwahrscheinliche Wahrhaftigkeiten, Improbable Veracities. Schiller's political views on the French Revolution, particularly his concept of a Brüderbund, a fraternal covenant, which feed into his drama Wilhelm Tell, are countered by Kleist's uncanny vision of an Amazon Schwesternbund put to the test in his tragedy Penthesilea. Finally, Schiller's theoretical discourse, certain key concepts such as grace and play, are critically examined in Kleist's essays, above all in the famous dialogue on the puppet theater über das Marionettentheater. It is this aspect of Kleist's engagement with Schiller's aesthetic theory that I will concentrate on in my talk. I will argue that by revising Schiller's concept of grace, Kleist also reverses his famous dictum according to which man attains his full humanity only in play. Der Mensch ist nur da ganz Mensch, wo er spielt. Kleist devises an alternative concept of play that foregrounds the elements of chance and of struggle. He thus anticipates modern cultural theories of play, such as Johann Hausinger's Homo Ludens or Roger Caillois' Les Jeux et les Hommes, theories that accord the ludic dimensions of Agon and Alia a seminal function within social order. But he also links up with romantic theories of play, such as Novalis' interpretation of language as a self-enclosed ludic system, language as a Wortspiel, a world in itself and a Welt für sich that produces meaning only on the condition that the speaking subject renounces control and allows language to play with itself. Moreover, Schiller and Kleist do not just represent divergent theoretical positions, they also stand for contrasting modes of theorizing. Schiller prefers a straight theoretical discourse devoid of playful elements which, not, notwithstanding its rhetorical flamboyance, strives to attain conceptual clarity. Kleist, by contrast, transposes Schiller's theoretical concepts into a ludic narrative constellation that implies a certain form of irony. In my analysis, I intend to proceed in three steps. First, I will outline Kleist's revision of Schiller's concept of grace and the concomitant notion of play in his essay on the puppet theater. Secondly, I will try to account for the fact that Kleist's rewriting of Schiller appeals so strongly to American deconstructive criticism, and I will show how deconstruction took up Kleist's ludic antagonism as a model for theoretical discourse. Finally, I wish to demonstrate that the constellation Kleist versus Schiller has not only infiltrated literary criticism, but also plays a role in fictional literature, for example, in the most recent novel published by the Nobel Prize winner John Kutzi, The Childhood of Jesus. Thus, I want to indicate that the German Romantic legacy is alive in areas where one would not suspect it to be, and that it is handed down by an author who, in the German tradition of scholarship, isn't even recognized as a proper representative of Romanticism. Kleist's famous essay on the puppet theater über das Marionettentheater, published in 1810, can be read as a response to Schiller's treatise Über Anmut und Würde on Grace and Dignity, written in 1793. Please allow me to recapitulate Schiller's argument, albeit in a very summary fashion. Schiller defines grace as the beauty of move movement, Schönheit der Bewegung. However, only specific movements of the human body can qualify as graceful. Grace appertains only to such movements as are produced under the influence of freedom. They are voluntary in a sense, in a sense, the qualifier in a sense is important. They are based on morality. According to Schiller, natural movements, motions driven by instinct or caused by some necessity of nature, are to be excluded from grace. Consequently, he denies animals the, capaci the capacity to be graceful. In his view, grace is a privilege of the human. Insofar as graceful movements are not instinctive, they partake of the sphere of freedom and volition. At the same time, however, grace requires a certain involuntariness. Graceful movements are both voluntary and involuntary. They express moral sentiment, but they must never be produced with the intention of doing so. <coughs> Rather, they betray the subject's acquired morality as if by coincidence. 
Graceful movements serve no communicative or pragmatic purpose. Therefore, they belong to the sphere of play. As an involuntary movement, grace gives morality the appearance of nature. It expresses a morality that has become second nature. The graceful subject executes its moral actions with the greatest ease as if they were the product of instinct. Mit einer Leichtigkeit, als wenn bloß der Instinkt handelte. In the graceful subject, the sensuous and the rational, the natural and the moral faculties of man act in harmonious accord. As Schiller puts it with reference to Kant, they interact in the manner of free play. Thus, grace marks the fullest realization of humanity, a state in which neither reason is dominated by the senses, nor the senses are subjugated to reason, but both are given their full due. It is important to note that this state is not a state of nature, but a state produced by education. Therefore, on Schillerian premises, small children cannot be graceful. By an aesthetic education that takes care not to develop reason at the cost of repressing the senses. <coughs> Thus, from Schiller's point of view, grace is not contingent, even though it appears to be so. It is man-made attribute of man. In his essay on the puppet theater, Kleist launches a severe attack against Schiller's concept of grace. The essay takes the form of a dialogue between the narrator and a certain Herzi, a professional dancer and thus an expert in grace. Herzi surprises his inter interlocutor by observing that grace is far more, likely <coughs> sorry, far more likely to be found in a puppet theater among inanimate dolls and marionettes than in a dance performed by human beings. Behind this provocative observation lies a patently anti-Schillerian theory of grace. According to Herzi, grace appertains either to natural movements, such as those caused by animal instinct, or the laws of physical nature, or to motions proceeding from divine beings, but emphatically not to movements produced by human beings whose faculty of reflection prevents their souls from entering into a harmonious relationship with their bodies. I quote, we see that in the same measure as reflection in the organic world becomes darker and feebler, grace there emerges in ever greater radiance and supremacy. Grace will be the most purely present in the human frame that has either no consciousness at all or an infinite amount of it, which is to say either in a marionette or in a god. End of quote. While Schiller reserves grace to the domain of the human, Herzi, in a secularized version of the Augustinian theology of the fall, tends to exclude common humanity from grace. In his view, grace is an attribute of the extreme poles of the creation of pure intelligence or pure matter, whereas in the middle ground occupied by human beings, impure hybrids of intellect and matter, it only appears sporadically. In Schiller's view, the middle ground constitutes the true home of grace, realized through the harmonious interplay of the faculties. He conceives of this harmony as a stable relation. It finds its expression in durable physical traits, a graceful habitus of the body, which preserves the imprints of certain graceful movements repeatedly made. According to Herzi, by contrast, the concordance of the faculties that is productive of grace rarely occurs in humans, and if so, only by accident and temporarily, without solidifying into a stable relation. Human grace is fortuitous and fragile. It issues in transient moments of grace. Kleist's narrator cites the example of a young man who coincidentally casting a look into the mirror catches a glimpse of himself in a graceful posture, but fails to reproduce it, however much he strives to do so. In Schiller, Grace appears as if by coincidence. In Kleist, its appearance, its appearance is a product of coincidence, though the subject can tragically mistake its accidental appearance for an essence. The fortuitous nature of grace seems to preclude the possibility of producing or reproducing it. It cannot be mastered, not even indirectly, by means of an aesthetic education. This, however, is the point where Kleist departs from his fictive persona Herzi. For though Herzi discloses the fortuitous nature of grace, though he asserts that it is impossible for grace to coexist with reflection, 
or to be mastered by means of rational planning and calculation, he makes precisely such an attempt. Relying heavily upon mathematical analysis, Herzé intends to construct a perfect, purely mechanical puppet that eliminates any remnant of human reflection. Paradoxically, he wants to eliminate reflection by way of reflecting, to achieve the incalculable by means of strict calculation, to realize natural grace through sheer artificiality. Kleist's text exposes this paradox not only by pointing to contradictions in Herzé's argument, his insistence on the incalculable contingency of grace on the one hand, his confidence in the power of rational calculation on the other, but also through the discrepancy between its discursive and its narrative components. The anecdotes recounted by Herzé and the narrator for the purpose of illustrating points of theory through examples also tell a different story. They reveal the futility of trying to master grace by way of intensifying reflection and calculation. Thus, the young man who perceives a graceful posture in the looking glass and vainly strives to embody the reflection he has seen to turn the fleeting image into bodily substance mirrors Herzé's attempt to materialize and stabilize grace by means of a mechanical law. And Herzé's desperate e efforts to overpower a fencing bear by means of feints mirror his attempts to outwit nature through art. The anecdotes do not exemplify the power of calculation and the mastery of theoretical reflection. They call it into question. In other words, narrative example fails to mediate between the generality of the theoretical concept and the particularity of intuition, just as, according to Kleist, Schillerian play fails to span the middle ground and to establish a stable relation between reason and the senses. To conclude, Kleist's Über das Marionettentheater reveals the unconquerable contingency of human grace and disavows the claim put forward by Herzé that grace can be attained by raising reflection to an ever higher degree. Is there an alternative to the infinite, infinite increase of reflection? Kleist conceives of an alternative, though it is only hinted at in the Marionettentheater, while he expands on it in some of his other essays. The alternative is a mode of play, but a kind of play that differs radically from Schiller's free play of the faculties. The play Kleist has in mind strives to reduce reflection and calculation to a minimum. Kleist's advice is to act without thinking, to defer reflection until after the act. This is not a method to master grace, but on the contrary, a way to make oneself vulnerable to the influence of the fortuitous the improbable and the incalculable. Reducing or deferring rational control over action means laying oneself open to risk. In a letter to his friend Rühle von Lilienstern, who had expressed his desire to cre create something beautiful and graceful, Kleist gives the following counsel. I quote, follow your feeling. What seems beautiful to you, that you should give us on the off chance of gut Glück. It is a toss of the dice but there's no other way. In a short essay entitled Reflection, a Paradox, he defines life as a struggle with fate and compares it to a wrestling match. The player who calculates his movements beforehand, he argues, is doomed to lose, whereas the wrestler who opens himself to the promptings of the moment remains able to react flexibly to the fortuitous twists and turns of the fight and therefore at least stands a chance to win. Finally, in his essay on the gradual production of thoughts while speaking, Kleist advises the debater to speak out before thinking. The surest way to win an argument is to renounce rational control over language, to let language play its own play in a manner akin to, no to Novalis's Wortspiel, though with a strong admixture of chance and agonism. Kleist's play of language can only work in a setting of agonistic dialogue, strife, and competition, while Novalis's Wortspiel is a monologue. His text is aptly entitled Monolog, language talking to and about itself. To sum up, Kleist likewise connects grace to the notion of play, albeit to a, motion of, uh, to a, to a mode of play that has nothing to do with Schiller's free play of the faculties if, according to Kleist, play can lead to grace, 
It is a form of grace that is abrupt and fleeting, and a form of play that is based on chance and violence, a ludic activity that involves the taking of risks, a sort of gambling. Thus, Kleist highlights the contingency of grace. Grace is contingent because it belongs to an order of being that is contingent in itself. It is not reducible to calculation. It cannot be mastered by the rules of probability. To expand upon the title of one of Kleist's stories, Improbable Veracities, truth and grace are to be looked for in the realm of the improbable. They are not a matter of careful calculation, but a matter of gambling, of daring to place one's stake on an improbable number. As I said at the beginning of my talk, Kleist is a favorite among post-structuralist thinkers. In France, Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari have identified Kleist as an author who exemplifies what they call nomadic thinking. In the United States, the most prominent rep representatives of deconstructive criticism, Paul DeMann, J. Hillis Miller, Carol Jacobs, Werner Hamacher, to name but a few, have written extensively on Kleist, regarding him not just as a producer of literary texts, but as a thinker who engages in a certain demanding mode of theoretical écriture. Significantly, both French and American critics placed Kleist in a context of strife and contest. Deleuze and Guattari emphasize his struggle with Goethe, while the American critics focus on his confrontation with Schiller. In their view, Kleist performs, performs the kind of ludic antagonism he talks about in his theoretical discourse, which can never be abstracted from its narrative setting. But what is the antagonism about? According to Paul de Man, its ultimate object is Kant's critique of judgment. As he sees it, Schiller fatally misreads Kant when supposing that aesthetic categories, such as grace and play, are apt to mediate between pure and practical reason and can therefore be employed as key elements of an aesthetic education. By hypostasizing the mediatory function of the aesthetic, Schiller establishes what the man regards as a dangerous ideology an aesthetic ideology, to quote the title of his posthumously published last book, and establishes an entire tradition of theoretical misreadings, extending from Arthur Schopenhauer and Matthew Arnold to Hans-Georg Gadamer and Hans-Robert Jaus. According to de Man, these thinkers have in common that they erroneously confuse reading with aesthetic perception, and thus miss out on the precarious linguistic status of literary texts. He credits Kleist with having unmasked Schiller's misreading of Kant and with having criticized Schiller's aberrant tendency to aestheticize language. In the man's view, Kleist thus succeeded in uncovering a radical strain within Kantian philosophy, but he did so in a complex and circuitous manner. By transcribing Schiller, Kleist also transcribed Kant the trance in transcribing, referring not only to the practice of transposing and transforming, but also to the agonistic act of surpassing a contestant in a competition for truth. As a transcriptor of Kant and Schiller, Kleist, on his, on his part, established a tradition of radical rereadings, a tradition which, according to Demann, comprises Nietzsche as a transcriptor of Schopenhauer, Derrida as a transcriptor of Heidegger, and the man himself as a transcriptor of Derrida. But if Yale School critics interpret Kleist as a transcriptor of theoretical discourse who manages to dismantle the ideology of the aesthetic, how do they imagine the act of transcription to function? What does it mean to theorize by way of transcribing? Strikingly, in their readings of Kleist, the adherents of this school do not focus on his dramas and novellas, but on his short essayistic prose, on texts such as the Marionettentheater on the gradual production of thoughts while speaking or improbable veracities. All these texts have a similar structure, characterized by Hillis Miller as follows, I quote, they consist of a series of short narratives exemplifying some difficult, ironic, or paradoxical conceptual point. Thus, theoretical reflection in Kleist proceeds from an abstract concept grace, for instance, which is given a paradoxical spin. A marionette is more graceful than the human dancer, for instance. In order to unfold the paradox, the text does not only engage in rational argument, 
but also resorts to narrative, to anecdotes and stories which provide graphic illustration for the theoretical points in question, or so it seems. Theoretical reflection in Kleist happens in the interspace between concept and example, between rational argument and literary narrative. This interplay is complex. In the last resort, the role of narrative cannot be reduced to the subservient function of mere illustration. To quote Hillis Miller again, the relation between theory and example is an uneasy one. Each flies off in, on a tangent of its own and exceeds the concept it is meant to exemplify. Thus, the narrative example transcribes the concept in the, in the sense of surpassing it. Instead of clarifying the concept and dissolving contradictions, it intensifies paradox. Since Plato, a specific function has been ascribed to the example, paradigma, within theoretical discourse, the function of simplifying and clarifying complex matters by constructing an analogy in the domain of the sensible. In the Politikos, Plato constructs an example in order to illustrate how examples work, a meta-example, so to speak. Significantly, the example he chooses is the example of reading. Paradigmata, he argues, are like short words consisting of few letters which can be decoded at a single view, whereas long, complex words must be spelled out laboriously letter by letter. Consequently, the example, paradigma, represents a mode of reading that strives to fuse reading with seeing. According to the Yale, stu Yale School critics, Kleist's narrative examples defy such a synthesis of reading and seeing. Rather than subordinating reading to seeing, they transcribe the objects of sense perception, that is, they turn the perceptual into language. Seeing is reduced to reading, which is conceived of literally as a kind of spelling, the, de the decomposition of words into the materiality of the letter. In his analysis of the Marionettentheater, Paul de Man demonstrates how Kleist's text, and especially the anecdotes included in it, play with the word fall and its derivatives, Sündenfall, Beifall, Rückfall, Einfall. Moreover, by placing the essay in the context of Kleist's reading of Kant on the one hand, Kafka's and Kierkegaard's putative readings of Kleist on the other hand, he deciphers the text and its intertextual extensions as, quote, a story that has so many Ks in it a sequence of variations on the letter K. Here, the elements of chance, by sheer coincidence, the names and questions all begin with the letter K, and of contest, the authors in question all strive to surpass each other in their readings of their respective predecessors, combine to constitute a specifically deconstructive version of Kleist's ludic antagonism. So much for attempts to revive Kleist's strife with Schiller in the context of deconstructive criticism. I would like to conclude my talk by alerting you to the fact that the antagonism between a Schillerian and a Kleistian notion of play has recently resurfaced in the context of contemporary literature, that is, in the writings of South African-born novelist John Coetzee. Kleist's works have always been an important point of reference to Coetzee. His novel Life and Times of Michael K, another variation on the letter K, can be read as a transcription of Kleist's novella Michael Kohlhaas. In his correspondence with the American writer Paul Auster, Kutzi expresses his admiration for Kleist. I quote, to open a page by Kleist is to have it brought home to you that there exists an A-league of writers which has very few members and in which the game being played is very different from the game in the more comfortable B League to which one is accustomed. Much harder, much quicker, much smarter, for much higher stakes." End of quote. Significantly, Kutzi compares Kleist to a player in the domain of competitive sports. He thus betrays his consciousness of what I have described as Kleist's ludic agonism. In fact, the problematics of sports and play are frequently featured in Kutzi's works in his critical writings as well as in his fiction. Kutzi's most recent novel, The Childhood of Jesus, to which I would now like to turn your attention, contains the most complex and ambitious discussion of play within the corpus of his works to date. The Childhood of Jesus tells the story of David and Simon, 
a small gifted boy and an elderly man, both are immigrants in a strange country. Simon has taken it upon him to look after David, who has lost his mother. While searching for the mother, they strive to integrate in the, into the society of their host country. Arbitrarily, it seems, Simon appoints Ines, a woman met by chance, to be David's mother. Miraculously, she accepts his choice, but the three find it difficult to settle down in a country that is increasingly experienced as hostile. In my interpretation of the text, Kutsi plays out a Kleistian against the Schillerian conception of grace and explores its potential for social bonding. Play seems om omnipresent in the fictive world of this novel. Its setting, the utopian or rather dystopian society of Nuvilla, displays features of a ludic sphere. Like a playing field, it is set aside spatially from the real world. It also pertains to a different time order. Life in Nuvilla has a circular structure. It proceeds outside linear history. Its inhabitants who possess goodwill but lack passion and desire do not seem to be fully human. They resemble play figures in a board game. Moreover, they have no memories and no past. They live in the present moment like players who are oblivious of everything outside the fictive world of the game. The term illusion, Ausinger reminds us, derives from the Latin illusio being inside the game. The society of Nuvilla is governed by rules, but they are not felt to be oppressive. They are readily embraced like rules of a game. However, if life in Nuvilla resembles a game, it is a game without suspense, a play that entails no risk. A further element of this society seems to jar with its ludic character. It requires its members to work. Simon, who as a newcomer finds it difficult to adapt to life in Novilla, remarks on the peculiar nature of this work, the work he and his comrades perform in the docks, for example. Labor in Novilla is unnecessarily hard and it seems to serve no higher purpose. Thus, there is no use for the huge amounts of grain unloaded by the dockers. Most of it is eaten by rats and the inhabitants of Novilla have small, if not ascetic, appetites. When Simon discusses the matter with his colleagues, they justify the work they do by referring to its social function. Quote, without labor and the sharing of labor, comradeship is not possible. Simon is not convinced by the argument. If comradely love is the ultimate good, he replies, why do we need to move these heavy bags of grain? Why not just kick a football? Simon thus points to the ludic structure of his host country's society. Like play, work in Novilla is an end in itself. Apart from joining the laborers together in an egalitarian community, it serves no pragmatic purpose. But if labor is like play, why labor at all? Why not play in the first place? Significantly, Simon's colleagues are irritated by this line of thought. He seems to have touched a sensitive spot. They refuse to accept the fact that their work is like play. A community based on mere play, they argue, is no longer substantial. Furthermore, without labor, they would lose touch with the thing itself. They would suffer alienation from the substantial truth of physical reality. It appears, therefore, that the society of Novilla possesses a thoroughly paradoxical structure. Social life here takes the form of play, but in order to fill this empty form, to give it some real substance, it must be fused with its opposite, hard physical labor. Or to put it otherwise, in order to lighten the heaviness of labor, it has given the form of play, but this form must not be disclosed to the laborers, lest they realize its autotelic emptiness. The people of Novilla are players in a game without knowing that they play. According to Hausinger, the common attitude of the player comprises both belief in the reality of the fictive world he has entered and simultaneous disbelief, being both inside and outside the artificial sphere of play at the same time. This double consciousness is akin to irony, which, as Simon quickly realizes, is totally absent from Novilla. The people of Novilla are naive players. They are part of an artificial machinery that parades as nature and which they mistake as such. The physical concreteness of their labor is, uh, to use Simon's expression, a mere pageantry. Their play, though art, has the appearance of nature. This is exactly what Schiller defines as grace. It is one of the many ironies of Kutze's novel 
that it presents sturdy stevedores as paradigms of Schillerian grace. Sure-footedly and nimbly, they carry heavy loads across a narrow plank. It comes as no surprise that Simon, who sees through the texture of Nevillean society, suffers a fall from this very plank. To conclude, Novilla can be interpreted as a parody of Schiller's aesthetic state. In Novilla, social life assumes the form of play, but this playful form conceals structures of violence that sustain the fabric of society. They become manifest as soon as David, the child whom Simon accompanies to Novilla, is initiated into its symbolic order by learning letters and numbers, which are offered to him as keys to the structure of the social and natural world. David represents a radically different notion of play, seemingly nar narcissistic and infantile. Quote, I don't like working, I like playing, he says. In fact, however, David's practice of play does not mark a flight into the cozy sphere of self-satisfying fantasy. Rather, it actively engages the contingency of social and cosmic disorder, a world of chance and risk. His mode of playing unhinges the opposition between seriousness and play, order and disorder, falling and flying, grace and perdition. One of his favorite games is called Truth or Consequences. David describes the rules of this game as follows, quote, I ask a question and you have to answer and you can't lie, you have to tell the truth. If you don't tell the truth, you have to pay a penalty, end of quote. This is a very strange game indeed since it turns truth, the kind of truth that is dead serious, and the coercive apparatus that is supposed to assure its seriousness into an object of play. It leads into a situation of aporia. As part of a game, the injunction to tell the truth cannot be meant seriously and thus gives the license to lie. But if the player lies, she breaks the rule that constitutes the fictive world of the game. Thus she steps out of the frame of the game and becomes serious. If she tells the truth, she does the same. She speaks seriously and so disobeys the command to play. The rule asks the player both to lie and not to lie, both to play and not to play. No wonder the players, Ines, Simon, Diego, and Daga, are totally at a loss. They cannot decide whether David is serious in his demand for truth or not, whether they are inside or outside the world of play. The game transgresses its boundaries and creates a space in which rules are simultaneously in force and in suspension. This uncanny world of serious play resembles the universe David imagines in his conversations with Simon, not a calculable universe held together by consistent laws of physics, but a universe full of unsuspected holes and gaps which imply the danger of a fall. While the adults who participate in the game are disconcerted by David's way of handling the rules, the boy himself enjoys the confusion he causes. He, quote, laughs out delightedly and whirls around in a dance, and his dance, we are told, is not without grace. Thus, the ludic suspension of rules is associated with gracefulness or even with a state of grace. The grace displayed by David is closer to Kleist than to Schiller in its conceptual alignment. This can be inferred from an episode in the childhood of Jesus that restages and revises a famous anecdote narrated within the framework of Kleist's Marionettentheater, the anecdote of the fencing bear. The episode goes as follows. David witnesses a scene of violence in the docks. After a week's hard work, Daga, another novice in Novilla, expresses his dissatisfaction with the pay and provokes a brawl with Alvaro, the foreman, in the course of which the latter is injured by a knife. Surprisingly, David, who has befriended the foreman, takes sides with the aggressor and reproaches Alvaro with having entered into the fight. Simon tries to explain that Alvaro is not to blame because he only tried to protect himself. But David persists in an unconditional rejection of any form of violence. His attitude seems to be close in spirit to Jesus' instruction delivered at the Sermon of the Mount. Simon regards David's stubbornness as a challenge to his role as mentor and educator. He wants to teach the boy a lesson about human nature, about the indomitability of natural instincts, such as the instinct of self-preservation. He feels provoked to teach this lesson in a practical manner. Quote, in all their time together, he has never let a finger on the boy, 
Now suddenly he raises a threatening hand. The boy does not bat an eyelid. He faints, to slap, uh, he faints a slap to his cheek. He does not flinch." End of quote. The scene recalls the story of the fencing bear told by Hatze in Kleist's dialogue on the puppet theater in order to illustrate his thesis that grace originates in natural instinct rather than in a reflection. In the grotesque fencing match between Hertzi and the bear, the bear proves to be an unbeatable contestant. Quote, not only did the bear, like the foremost fencer in the world, parry all my thrusts, when I fainted, he did not even react. Looking me in the eye as though he could read my soul in it, he stood with his paw lifted in readiness, and when my thrusts were not seriously intended, he did not move." End of quote. Both Hertzi and Simon fail in their attempts to overcome their opponents by feigning a stroke. But they fail for different reasons. Kleist's bear is not aggressive. He never attacks Herzi, but only reacts when seriously assailed by the fencer. All his actions spring from the instinct of self-preservation, and this instinct proves to be infallible. David, by contrast, has mastered his instinct, or so it seems. For in closer inspection, his reaction proves to be enigmatic. There are two possibilities. Either he does not see through Simon's feint, but takes his stroke to be serious. In this case, he has truly mastered his instinct, and his, re and his reaction or non-reaction is more than human, an instance of godlike grace, as Herze would put it. Or he does see through Simon's feint. The boy stares at him piercingly, we are told. Like the bears, his instinct turns out to be infallible, and he thus displays a purely natural grace. David seems to be either God or animal. He is not to be classed with the middle ground of humanity. But is this really so? If David sees through Simon's feint, it is equally possible to, to interpret his non-reaction to the stroke as a feint as well. Having realized that his mentor does not intend to strike him seriously, he feigns the mastery over his instincts. He plays along with Simon and beats him at his game of feigning. In this case, he is neither God nor innocent animal, but a skillful player and an inscrutable imposter. He wins the game because he succeeds to blur the line between seriousness and play. Just as in the game of truth or consequences, it is impossible for Simon to decide whether David just plays or acts seriously. There is no way of determining whether his grace is divine, natural, or human. Simon's reaction to this impasse is significant. All right, he says to David, I believe you. To make a decision, he must take a risk. He must commit an act of faith. Simon's belief in David prefigures the decision taken by himself and Ines at the end of the novel to leave their life and novella behind and to follow David into a new life however uncertain it might be. The new community constituted by David is a community of believers. It requires a risky leap of faith. Here again, Kutzi's novel keeps track of Kleist's Marionettentheater. Glauben Sie diese Geschichte? Do you believe this story? Herze asks after concluding the wildly improbable anecdote of the fencing, fencing beer. Absolutely, the narrator replies. I should believe it from any stranger. It is so very likely. How much more so from you? Thank you for your patience. by trying to say that you wanted to uh, understand Kleist as a romantic. And uh, I rightly applaud that intention. I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to it. <clears throat> but then you began on Kleist's relationship to Schiller. And there's a, there's a suppressed premise in your argument. And I mean, the suppressed premise is that in some way, Schiller seems to be a classicist. And Kleist, as his critic, is therefore a romantic. But you know, that, that is a premise that people have questioned. 
And I, I don't believe they're questioning, but anyway, some people would like to say Schiller is himself a romantic, in which case if they, so you have to parry that thrust. If you don't, your whole thesis tumbles down. And I think that's very important. And it, it's not as if Schiller just is an interpretation of Kant, an, an interpreter of Kant, the way in which uh, the man understands him. He is much more than that. Schiller never understood himself as just interpreting Kant. He knew he was going beyond it. So there's more to it than just, well, Schiller's a Kantian, and therefore he's a classicist and an enlightened guy. There's a, there's a long tradition of interpreting Schiller as a romantic. I'm not, again, I'm not sympathetic to it. But that seems to me to be an important part of your argument, which you need to explain a bit more. Maybe you could do that now. <clears throat> well, um, the thing is, uh, Kleist uh, thoroughly, thoroughly read Schiller. Um, so thoroughly what? Thoroughly. Really, he's a very close reader of Schiller. Kleist is a very close reader of Schiller. Um, so um, my, my answer to your to your uh, doubts about my thesis, um, I would say, yes, you're right. Um, but what Kleist is doing, he's building up within his concept of, of this antagonist ludism, he's, he's building up kind of a, a sparring partner. And he's looking for a, a partner who's, who's, um, uh, who, who's kind of a, a, a contestant which gets most out of himself. So it's, it's, I'm not talking about the real Schiller here, but I'm talking about the fictive persona that Kleist is building up in order to, to set the stage for, for a contest, uh, which, which allows him to put into play his, machine, his machinery of, of playing out narrative against theory. Uh, that was probably um, kind of, um, well, uh, a, a point I didn't highlight enough, that I'm not talking about the real Schiller, I'm not talking about the aesthetic education, which is very, I, I love this text, it's, it's complex, and I would agree with you that it's, uh, it's uh, 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 I think it's, it's a good idea to try to read Schiller as a romantic as well. And as, uh, at the beginning I said, I, I'm, I'm uh, sympathetic with uh, the Anglo-American kind of more loose concept of romanticism which allows to see Schiller or Goethe as romantics as well and Kleist as well. Um, no, what I wanted to show is that uh, Kleist tried to build up uh, contests and uh, the deconstructive critics uh, hinged on to that uh, or, or, or uh, tr tried to make use of that for their own way of theorizing. It's kind of, it's, it's like the machine that Hatzi is trying to to construct, it's it's a, a theory machine, and it's a machine that works. Um, and, and you need a kind of a puppet. You need a dummy for it. And Schiller, in this uh, context, is the dummy that uh, Kleist is setting up in order to uh, put on stage his fight. And it's a fight between theoretical discourse and narrative. And he's he's playing out these. Um, that would be kind of my. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I can see that. Well, uh, if you're at a loss, I think I achieved one of my aims, which was to, <laughs> to uh, as you can tell from, from the rhetoric of my talk, uh, I, I wanted um, my, my dummy is uh, the way um, German Germanistic builds up a certain concept of romanticism. And um, the way of you know my interpreting Kleist as somebody who was always seen as an eccentric, he's always you know an outsider. He doesn't have anything to do with with the discourses going on at the time. Um, was to to, uh, to to call into question this concept of romanticism, which in German literary history has uh, a certain uh, standing, and uh, you know that was 
So it's, uh, the confusion about romanticism is kind of um, uh, something uh, I would, it, it's a stroke uh, against a, a, a tradition of German scholarship, which tries to tie romanticism to a very, um, to a very narrow way of seeing things. And, and interesting talk. So you clearly showed uh, how uh, the resources in Kleist for, um, for issues that interest us. Uh, one uh, term that is of no interest whatsoever to somebody like Deman, and as far as I know also not to Deleuze, is the central term for Kleist, which is grace and anmut. So are you also making, uh, that I would find very exciting, some plea or some, some argument for energizing that term for our, for our use? Or, or are you also not? Is that is that? Are we done with? No, I, 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 uh, that was the reason why I, 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 I called in Kutsi into the question here because uh, this this novel, which a lot of people have difficulty coping with, puts the question of grace on the agenda again. And uh, uh, if, if Schiller and Kleist are not the only theoreticians of grace who are interesting in this context, but of course they, they're statements uh, constitute um, a, a very um, important episode in the history of the concept of grace. So um, I think, um, yes, uh, the concept of grace is a question which uh, is a concept which needs to be rethought. And uh, uh, I was trying to get at this by way of Kutze, reading, rereading Kleist, so to speak, uh, with Kutze in my mind. And um, in, in Kutsi, the, the, the provocative thing is that the, the novel is called The Childhood of Jesus. Um, uh, you have loads of allusions to the New Testament. Uh, David, is David Jesus as a child? Is he or is he not? Uh, how does uh, um, his notion of grace, is it a grace which is a secular notion of grace or if you talk about grace, uh, do you necessarily bring the theological um, context into play? Um, Kleist does, um, very strongly, because um, as the man uh, said, the fall, the fall is, is the key uh, word in this, in this uh, dialogue. Um, so um, the question is, can you talk about grace without um, talking about theological issues? Sure. 